Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. We have a newcomer for the Gibson Original Collection. I have a real soft spot in my heart for the whole original and modern collection because, you know, it was Gibson, you know, reinventing themselves under new management. So finally getting something new within this collection is really exciting for me. And what they've decided to do this time is the Les Paul Deluxe. Now, in case you happen to have missed the video when I accidentally stumbled upon that these were going to be coming out sometime in March. I mean, I didn't know for 100% sure, but, but there was a dealer who told me to expect these things. But unfortunately, we still don't know the specs. At the time of recording this, it's not even on Gibson's website. It's not officially out, but today is the launch day. These were sent to me by Gibson, but I did purchase them. So it's not a sponsored review in any means, and I don't have to say good things. I can say bad things. I can say whatever I want about these things. But I am more so interested in seeing what specs and are these things actually worth it? So let's go ahead and get the very first look at the brand new original collection 70s Les Paul Deluxe. Let's check this thing out. It's a gold top. Okay, so why this is kind of a big deal that the Les Paul Deluxe is making a comeback is the fact that there has not been a proper Les Paul Deluxe on the market for about 15 years. I mean, you could argue the 2018 Deluxe Player Plus was technically a Deluxe, but those things had flame tops. They were more so a Firebird-esque mini humbucker, whereas these guys have the tiny little pole pieces, which I appreciate. And they also had rich light fretboards. And outside of that, it was back in 2015 when there was a Deluxe, but that one, it had the 2015 specs, which not everyone liked. You know, like the Robo Tuners, the Wide Nut with the Les Paul 100 logo. But instead of a proper control layout, two volumes, two tones, they had a mini toggle switch down here for some sort of a boost. So that's not necessarily a Les Paul Deluxe in my opinion, like this guy is. I mean, there was a Japan exclusive run in 2018 for a select dealer, so I, I don't know if you can really count that as in production if it was only in Japan. But now we finally have this one. So my big question was, what were they actually trying to model this after? Because just calling it a 70s Deluxe is actually kind of confusing because specs were vastly different on these things in the early 70s and the late 70s. So the best way to categorize a deluxe is from 1969 to about 1975. Starting around like mid 75, they go through a whole bunch of changes, including a maple neck. Now, it looks like what they've done here is they are emulating an earlier 70s deluxe with the mahogany neck, but it does feel rather big, honestly. I was expecting these to be super slim because that's how most of those are. It doesn't look like they went as far as uh, replicating a pancake body on here, so if you were worried about that, uh, don't be. Now, as far as the pieces on the top, most of the deluxes in that era would be at least three pieces. This one, uh, we can't tell because it is a gold top finish. So I was kind of hypothesizing that this would basically be the 50s P90 Les Paul standard, but with mini humbuckers. I thought maybe it would have like a slim 60s neck. Honestly, this has some beef to it. So it's not that much different as compared to that 50s P90. They just have different pickups in here. So I don't think it was that hard for them to tool this because they didn't go as far as like doing the big 70s headstock. But again, it's more of like a 70s tribute rather than a one for one replica. Interesting choice to go back to the Nashville style bridge. I was not expecting that. That's another small difference. Kind of questionable, to be honest. And we don't actually get the thumb bleeders, you know, the pointers that show you the numbers. That's kind of a letdown. So unfortunately, the only thing 70s about this really comes down to our mini humbuckers. But hey, we finally have a Les Paul Deluxe in the lineup. And it's coming in two different colors, and they are the same price as the other 50s, 60s Les Paul standards, $24.99. We've got the gold top, very, very, very iconic finish. But what is the other accompanying finish for this run? Let's find out because that is inside of this box right here. Yes, that's right, I bought one of each just to see. And I've gotta say, even though the gold top is the most, you know, a sought after iconic one of the 70s outside of like rare limited edition finishes, I'm kind of more 
excited about this one, despite not liking this color on the older models. And it's mainly because, you know, it more so reminds me of the 70s. Good old clown burst. But real talk for a minute here. I mean, these colors were kind of already in production on the 50s and 60s standards. So I'm sure it was just easier for them to start with these. I'm really hoping that they do some more finishes on these in the future to kind of help differentiate these between the other 50s, 60 standards, as well as introduce a late 70s deluxe. Because the maple neck would have definitely made this a much cooler release in my opinion. But I get it, most people prefer the mahogany. But inside here, sleeps cherry sunburst. Oh, that's sweet. I like it. Really ridiculously dark fretboard on this one. So our main difference for this will be, we can finally see how many pieces of a top they decided to do. That's a really well-matched two-piece top. So unfortunately, I, I have to give Gibson an F if they were really going for 70s specs on this, because I mean, we don't even have a volute on this thing. <laughs> Oh man, that's, that's kind of a letdown, I've got to say that. But if you've been looking for a stock Les Paul with really nice mini humbuckers, I think that's who these are going to appeal to. I'm not noticing anything hugely vastly different about this finish as compared to the other 50s and 60s standards that I've owned. It might be a, a little bit more cherry. Like I think they did attempt to go for a little bit more of that clown-esque burst, but these are really solid and chunky, so they got that right. But before we throw these things on the workbench, I think it'd be fun to, uh, you know, A-B comparison this to a real 70s Les Paul Deluxe. Which I just so happen to have right here. So this is a really rare finish Sparkle Top Deluxe from my personal collection. So obviously case is vastly different. But here is what a vintage Deluxe looks like. Now this one still has replaced knobs, but here you can kind of see what I've been talking about. How these guys have this giant headstock. Oh, that's the other thing I was really hoping they would do. At least get this spec right and have double ringed Clusens. But unfortunately, no, they went with the single. That's kind of an oversight in my opinion. I was really hoping. But these guys have always had such thin pencil necks. So if you hate these really slim necks, you're gonna like the newer Deluxe. And you can see here the low wide frets of the Norlin era versus the modern medium jumbos. Honestly, that's probably a good thing for most players. <laughs> Our mini humbuckers are looking good. They've got the correct surrounds. And you can kind of see those other things we were talking about earlier, like the thumb bleeders missing on that. Why they didn't go for the faux BR1, that's beyond me. And when I talk about a pancake body, this is what we're talking about. So it's two pieces mahogany and a very small center stripe of maple. It's just a sandwich of that. Some people think they were trying to save money, but it was actually more labor intensive. But then they could uh, make more guitars, I guess. But they decided to go super traditional on this one with a one piece body. Oof, and they, they even got the back plate colors wrong. I really, really wish they will change that in the future because they should have brown back plates. That's easy enough to do. As added insult to injury, the old cherry sunbursts also got a burst on the back. And I think that would have made up for these things technically being like a 50s plain top Les Paul standard. Because really the only difference are our pickups here. But the price is the same as a flame top. So really the Deluxe is just a report of the 50-60s standard because they did not get, you know, pretty much any minute detail of the 70s correct on these, unfortunately. But it's fun to check them out side by side anyways. Will I do a tone comparison? I guess we could do that. Because now that we know that the specs aren't necessarily 100% correct, all we can do now is look at quality control as well as hear how these new mini humbuckers sound. So let's go ahead and throw this cherry sunburst on the workbench and take an individual look at its parts and specs. Inside the new 70s Les Paul Deluxe. I've been thinking about it. This would more accurately be described as an 80s deluxe, in my opinion, because, you know, around 82, 83, they switch back to the mahogany necks. They do get a little bit thicker. They also start to get these smaller styled headstocks. You can find two-piece top deluxes in that era. Typically, they would be highly flamed, but I guess it's possible you could find a plain top one like this. I mean, almost all the specs lines up with that. So maybe what they were actually trying to do 
was just mix the best of like all three of the main iterations of the 70s and 80s deluxe. But it's called Rhythm Les Paul Deluxe Pickup, and this was made uh, February 8th of 2021. And our bridge pickup, it's probably just called the Lead. Yep, Lead Les Paul Deluxe. But let's take a look inside our pickup cavities. You will see we have a short neck tenon, which is exactly what I was expecting and would technically be correct for an 80s Les Paul Deluxe, but not an early 70s Deluxe. But again, remember, it's not meant to be a reissue. It's just meant to be kind of a, a tribute with some specs, right? But stock from the factory, you have these little base plates in here. And so, you've got two screws that secure it right here into the body. However, what's nice about mini humbuckers is say you give it a try, but you don't like it. And you do like P90 pickups. A P90 will drop directly in here. And what's extra nice is you see this extra deep channel route right here. That's so if you want to swap it, you can. And then instead of using these outside screws in order to secure it to it, you'll be using these two because the securing screws are in the middle of a P90. So that was actually rather considerate of them in my opinion. As far as the routes themselves, they actually look pretty clean. But the bridge pickup route has a really interesting phenomenon. So right here, they don't actually have to route it deep enough to get all the way through the maple cap. So what you're seeing here is just a little sliver of the maple cap left right here, and then you just barely make it to the mahogany body right here. So that's actually kind of cool. And it reads LPSIG, which I'm not really quite sure what that would stand for. Les Paul Sunburst Igloo. As far as our pickup ratings go, the bridge pickup is a 6.22k ohms, and our neck pickup about the same, 6.11, so probably what, 3-ish? Yeah, 3.08 in the middle. So a little less output than a regular humbucker, but they just kind of have their own unique sound that we'll have to check out. And now going on to our Nashville style bridge. These are made by Advanced Plating Incorporated. You can see the API branding right here. That's another one of those things having the Nashville kind of puts it in a late 70s deluxe. And I think I remember uh, talking about this subject because when they do the Gibson USA ABR1s, I call them the faux BR1. And I say that because they have posts into the body instead of being just drilled directly to the top like their historic brethren. I, I get it. It's a premium feature. So honestly, I think it makes more sense to have these style bridges on them. And from a setup standpoint, this is the version that uses the Allen key adjustments right here, so you don't even have to use the thumb wheels. That helps you uh, set your action, even if you have full string tension on. You just have to use your included Gibson multi-tool, which you should find in your case. And the tailpiece is also lightweight aluminum. And while the color might not be perfect on these reflector knobs, it is the correct style for an early 70s one. And the emitted thumb bleeders would be correct for an 80s deluxe. And our pick guard here, it's just cut for the mini humbuckers. That's pretty much the only difference here. And they do have that little felt pad right there to prevent that little ding. So if you want to take the pick guard off, this is what it's going to look like. But I believe I'll be leaving that pick guard on. Oh man, I'm just realizing they stopped putting those little stickers over top of the pick guard, probably so people didn't feel bad about removing the protective film over top of it. I always like the way new guitars look though, with that little shiny medallion on it right there. But anyways, two-piece maple top, as we can see here on this beautiful cherry sunburst example. Otherwise, it'd just be covered over. So I guess technically, in theory, you might be able to find one that has some figuring if you shop around at a whole bunch of different dealers, and then it is a solid mahogany body. So far, the 50s and 60s standards have stood the test of time of being great guitars. So if you like those and you just want one that's different with mini humbuckers, I think you're going to like this thing. But check out this fretboard, ultra dark. We get the acrylic trapezoid inlays, but I just want to say fantastic fretwork on this. Like Gibson gets beat up a lot for having like tooling marks on their fretboard and the fret nibs not being nice. This example looks great. I didn't quite look at that uh, other one, so just because mine was good doesn't mean yours will be good. But so far, I've got to say, this was really, really well crafted. So we can give that to them. Like, I don't even think I see any tooling marks. So I think this stuff is just, you know, part of the wood grain. So nice. And I didn't condition this or anything. This is exactly how it came from the factory. But let's go ahead and measure our Graftech nut. We get a 1.7 inch nut width which is more of a modern spec, and about 2.11 at the 12th. First fret neck depth, 0.92, and right past the 11th, it's 0.97. So this is kind of more of a Chunky's 50 neck, in my opinion. They just call it a rounded C shape. 
We'll capture that with the contour gauge when we get onto the back. But here is our headstock, just a regular style Gibson Mother of Pearl logo with the Les Paul model silkscreen. Truss rod is in here if you need to use it. And the truss rod cover itself does read deluxe, so that's a nice little touch. Technically, if you want to get really picky, they could have went for the vintage style Clusons that don't actually secure to the top like this. They just have a bushing system. So once again, this is more so like an 80s spec. Moving on to the backside, let's take a look at our wiring. So this kind of reminds me of like a late 70s deluxe when they introduced like the shielding base plate. Now this isn't exactly the same. This is just the style that they've been using for a while. Here's what our toggle switch cavity looks like. Now, unfortunately, I can't save them saying, oh, in the 80s, they used black back plates for the deluxe. No, they were always brown. So I really think they should at least change that to, you know, give it a little bit more 70s flair. And they're using the more modern style large strap buttons, which I'm sure modern players will appreciate. I do want to mention that the gold top one actually has the more standard traditional style strap buttons on it. So apparently it's just kind of luck of the draw, whichever one you get. But the back is quite nice on this one. It's got some moving grain figuring going on. Moving up to the back of the neck, you can see the beautiful mahogany wood grain. Let's go ahead and grab that contour gauge. So we've got first fret here, 12th fret over there. Definitely a rounded C-shaped neck profile. To tell you the truth, I'm actually kind of happy they went with this neck profile. That slim, super slim 70s neck is definitely not for everybody but I've just kind of grown accustomed to it. Uh, made in USA, made on the 8th of February, if I'm reading that correctly, 39th day of the year, 2021, 123rd in production within the first batch. That's just for that particular day, not for the Les Paul Deluxe model. But now the all important question, what kind of binding do we have? Thin binding in the cutaways. But the only thing left for us to capture is the weight itself. This particular one weighs nine pounds, 4.3 ounces. So not too bad for a solid body guitar, but that's gonna vary example to example. As far as the QC goes on this instrument, gotta say, very, very well crafted guitar. I might expect it differently if I was in charge of things, but just judging it based off of what it is, it definitely meets my expectations that I've come to expect from the original collection. But let's go ahead, plug this thing in and hear how it sounds. But I think for the playing demo, we'll go ahead and use the gold top since the cherry sunburst has gotten enough screen time, I think. <laughs> Let's go ahead and run through the tones of this deluxe. It's a really spanky guitar, so our bridge pickup, nice and bright. Neck pickup, complete opposite. It's still bright and clear, but still has that juiciness that you're used to. Obviously, the middle just kind of mixes those up.
like a regular Les Paul in that aspect, so I think that's a great thing that they have brought mini humbuckers back to the regular lineup. They're not going to be for everybody, but I think when you're nailing certain 70s sounds, like, this guitar keeps jumping out different songs that I forgot that I like to play. Let's go ahead and switch over to some distortion now. <laughs> It sounds pretty good in the room. I'll let you guys judge the recording itself. But nice and bitey and clear. Now let's go ahead and compare it to my 1974 Sparkle Top Deluxe. See how those pickups stand.
final thoughts on the new Gibson Les Paul 70s Deluxe. As a 70s Deluxe, it's an absolute fail. They pretty much did nothing different as compared to the 50s P90. However, it is a fantastic guitar. So if you like the mini humbucker sound and you've been looking for a guitar like that and you just want an excellent playing and sounding instrument, I would highly recommend this. You can normally tell in my playing demos if I really, really like a guitar and this is like instant bonding for both of these. I ended up falling in love with the gold top. But then again, the cherry sunburst isn't too bad if you like that 70s kind of clown burst-esque. They probably could have went even crazier if they wanted to, but great guitars. I would suggest checking one out. Just definitely go into it not thinking it's going to have a bunch of 70s specs. But at the same time, I think that's also a good thing. Not everybody likes those pencil thin necks that the 70s deluxes have, and they don't like those small frets. I actually found these easier to play. Pairing the tones between the two, which one did I prefer? I think for the cleans, I like the vintage sounding one just a little bit better. However, I think these sounded just a little bit more clear when they were dirty, whereas this one had a little bit more mud. And that's what's kind of unique. You can pick up a vintage less Paul Deluxe for about the same price as one of these. You're gonna pay a lot more if you want my blue sparkle top. But if you get kind of a beat up old vintage deluxe, you can definitely find them for that price. But a clean vintage original will probably run you between $1,000 to $1,500 extra, assuming that they don't go up in price now that these things come out. I actually found that this was the easier playing guitar because those tall frets, when we talk low wide frets on a vintage original, I mean, they're pretty low. So doing big bends up at the 12th fret and higher, definitely easier on this guitar. Do I feel like these new ones are worth $2,500? I feel kind of shortchanged, honestly. In comparison to like the flame top 50s or 60s Les Paul standard, you're paying the exact same price, but you're getting less features on these. It'd be one thing if they got some of those acute 70s details, like the cherry sunburst. Since it doesn't get the flame top like a 50s, 60s standard, they could give it the 70s burst on the back. Or to differentiate this model, give it the maple neck. So yes, it's worth it. However, I could definitely see somebody still choosing a standard over the Deluxe. The Deluxe is kind of a, a niche market that I'm glad they're fulfilling. So I'm both sad and happy at the same time that they didn't, you know, do all of the 70s specs, but I mean, they could have at least got the back plates right. Gave us the cool double banded tuners, but unfortunately, no. But troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed checking out the new Les Paul Deluxe with me. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care. If you're now interested in purchasing one of these and found my review helpful, you can thank me by purchasing one using my affiliate link through Sweetwater. You can find that in the description. All you have to do is click on it and order it through their website, and I will automatically be credited with the sale and receive a small commission. Thank you.